Nerd to the Third Power presents Fools Who Ride The Dreamstone Epilogue Greetings and well met, my friends and fellow travelers of the podcast world. I am your dungeon master slash storyteller, Mike the Birdman Dodd from ThisWeekInGeek.net, and you are listening to Fools Who Ride the Dreamstone, brought to you by Nerds of the Third Power. This is an actual play D&D podcast where the rules really don't matter. We do our best. We fly by the seat of our pants. We try to make this a little bit rock and roll for you all to enjoy at home. But I'm not alone as I trek through the world of Faerun in the Forgotten Realms. I'm joined in the land of misery, otherwise known as Missouri. I'm the cat, and I'm playing Lenore Longfellow, a level three human plague doctor cleric. And of course, it is not Nerd of the Third Power without Radio Sega's own. It's Skyblaze, and I am playing Alisaria Sunshadow, a level three high elf paladin. And of course, it is the master of ceremonies, the master of none, the guy who can't stand a single jalapeno on his sandwich. Dr. Gonzo playing Marcus Hawk, a level three human knight who is breathing a heavy sigh of relief that his crazy ass gamble actually worked. So, yes, we are finding ourselves finally emerging back into the town of Cambridge after the events of Clovis's lair and the apparent defeat of the demon lord Pazuzu. What that mad what happens now? Well, we don't know. So it's about a day and a half later, you do manage to walk back in to Cambridge, and the town seems quiet. Like the people are going about their business in in the streets. Nobody really knew who you were before. They're not paying you any mind now. So you eventually walk through the city town. As, as we walk through the market, I'm gonna I'm gonna surreptitiously lean over to to Alisari and whisper, "Do you think these people have any idea that they very nearly all just died? That they very nearly all died today." Probably not. Uh, does the atmosphere feel different? I mean, when we were here before, it felt a bit tense. People were tired and um, uh, uneasy. Has things have things changed? Yes, the atmosphere just feels laid back, like very. Very much a 180 from things from how they were before. Things seem quiet. Okay. Quaint. Good. So as you start walking through the streets, things, like I said, things just seem like they're back to normal, such as normal can be for a town like uh, Cambridge. You do see a couple of Fire Forge dwarves still continuing to work on their various projects in the city. You approach Lord Kilsha's Manor. The guards let you through without any any trouble. They recognize you. They're like, oh, you're the adventurers uh, our master sent out for. So please come up to the main house and we'll see you right in. So you're eventually led back up to the main house. The court wizard, Mari, meets you at the front gate and goes, well, how did it go? Things well, have been quiet the last 24 hours. Well, we've got good news and we've got bad news. Which would you like first? Well, as it is Cambridge, we're most often dealing with something being screwed up. So what is the bad news, good good Sir Marcus? And without a word, I'm going to reach into my pouch and pull out the shards of the Dreamstone and show them to Mari. She's like, oh, oh dear. Well, that's not good. Clovis smashed it with his own hands to stop a demon prince from sending an undead army to overrun the city. He was siphoning souls into it to bring the demon Pazuzu into the mortal realm. But there was still some good in him. And at the last moment, he turned his back on the darkness and destroyed the Dreamstone to save the city he loved. Sadly, Clovis himself also passed in, the, in these events. She uh, takes the powder you have and puts it in a pouch on her belt and goes, well, maybe I can reconstitute it. I, I don't know. This was given to us by a god, a goddess herself, Mistara, as a gift to the city of Cambridge. And uh, maybe we can restore it. I 
don't know. I mean, better in our hands than in the hands of Pazuzu or one of his avatars. So most certainly you've done Cambridge a service. I don't know how Lord Kilsch will take this news, but better this than the alternative. We noticed. Um, well, in that, on that note, we should probably speak to the Lord and Lady because there's more to the story that they need to hear. Pazuzu. Pazuzu may be gone, but there are still ripples from this uh, from this that w may still affect Cambridge in the future. She says, well, absolutely. If you come with me, um, I'll lead you right up to Lord Kilsh's, uh, Lord Kilsh's area. Um, she leads you up into, I guess, what would be the equivalent of a throne room. Basically where he en entertains people. And audience you see chamber. Audience chamber. So you see him... Um, sitting on his chair, sitting beside his lady, Lady Kilsch, and um, they're just sitting there having tea and biscuits. Not really, kind of having much of anything except a really pleasant conversation. You do see um, there's a son and daughter just kind of playing with a ball back and forth on, on the floor. You don't see Neslo, which was the son you did encounter before. A really racist one. Yeah, the the real big prick and douchebag. Um, but as you enter the room, they're like, "My friends, you've come back. What news do you bring me, Mari? Do they have the Dreamstone?" In a manner yep. of speaking, Mari looks at Lord Kilsh and just solemnly shakes her head and Lord Kilsch kind of sits down his cup and saucer and he's like, what do you mean? Things are different. You must have been successful. Mari, just rip off the band-aid and show it to him. She uh, walks up to Lord Kilsch closely, puts the bag pretty much very close to him and he's like, it's gone. What are we going to do now? I mean, how are we going to do? How are? What are we going to do? Trade's going to slow down. the 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 economy's going to change. My my lordship could be in trouble now. Like you'll, people you'll come from cope. all around. You'll have to cope the same way that every other city does. I'm sorry, my lord, but this was the price we had to pay to defeat a demon. We should probably just start from the top. Please do. So, so as you're already aware, Clovis stole the Dreamstone to try to bring back his family. To do so, he entered into a pact with a demon prince named Pazuzu. The plan, as far as I understand it, was he was going to siphon the souls of, of Cambridge into the stone and present it to the demon so that Pazuzu could enter the mortal plane. To accomplish this, he raised an undead army that he was going to, to use to attack Cambridge in accordance with, I guess, an orc war band, along with, some, along with at least one sorcerer from the land of Ordo. Kilsch goes the Ordo, but we're on good terms with them, more or less. Clovis Maybe it's is a, a little tense at times, but... Clovis's accomplice was a, was a sorcerer from Ordo named Para, who, based on our conversations with him indicated that uh, while you may be friendly towards Ordo, the reverse is certainly not true. How reliable Lord, his information is, is debatable. But... Lord Kilsch and Lady Kilsch exchange looks. They're like, Para, really? You think so? We also encountered an elvish fleshsmith named Silvio, who was helping to, who was all, who was helping to make the undead army. And he too bore the mark of Ordo. Lord Kilsch looks gravely concerned when you keep mentioning Ordo. He's like, please go on. Clovis made his, his <clears throat> fortress in a temple in the Cloakwood, deep in the Cloakwood. That was where he had taken the Dreamstone, and that was where he was intending to make the swap to, with the Dreamstone to get his family back. But I am happy to say that there was still some humanity left in Clovis, and at the last moment... He turned from the darkness and he destroyed the Dreamstone to release the souls contained therein to send and sent the demon back to whatever pit it came from. Unfortunately, Clovis himself also passed and gave his life in this act. This was all, this was all we could I'll, recover. 
I'll take his sword and uh, kind of put it across my arms and present it to him. Kilsh takes it. He looks at it, examines the blade. It goes, well, it does bear the mark of our family. Clovis was a trusted friend at one point. Lady Kilsh looks kind of aback. She looks shocked and sad. Um, and she says, she looks at all of you, says she was, he was never the same after his family passed. He took up the sword more aggressively than most, but uh, he loved our city as much as anybody could. And he threw himself at every battle he possibly could, fully believing that if he just, he really believed if if he suffered enough, the gods would reward him, and they never did. The gods aren't cruel. They are just, and their ways are unknowable to us. Indeed. We intended to bring his body back for a proper burial, but for reasons known only to the gods themselves, his body discorporated before we could bring it here. Hmm. They continue looking, and they look at Lenore. They're like, you've been quiet, Plague Doctor. What do you make of the events that have happened to you? Seems to me like too many people have spent too long dreaming. Too many people have spent too long in a world of fantasy and not enough in the world of reality. And this dreamstone vanishing might be good for this place because now you can pay attention to the things that are really important. What you've built here, Cambridge is, from what I've seen, a great city, but it was not built because it, it did not achieve that level because of the dreamstone. Everything you've built here, you've built with your own hands, and that hasn't changed. The gods can guide, they can protect, they can aid, but they don't do the work for us. They're, they say, Lady and Lord Kill say, we're worried things are going to change now. We're worried about, we're worried about the, the people out there, of course, that everyone from the lowly dock workers to the beggars in the streets to even the nobles we have around the city. This is going to change Cambridge. And now that we know that Ordo is potentially lurking in the shadows for whatever nefarious purpose, we don't know whether we can trust them. We, I thought they were our allies, our friends. This Paris has sat at my table. We've shared drink together. To know Unfor that he is a traitor. Unfortunately, he escaped in the confusion in the temple, so we cannot speak to his whereabouts. However, if you fear military action on the part of Ordo and you don't have a standing defense force of your own, I would suggest uh, sending a missive to Clan Fireforge. I know that the that the Lord there likes to protect those that he does dealings with, that Lord Fireforge likes to protect those that he has good business with. So you might be able to negotiate a reasonable rate for some dwarfs or some Fireforge mercenaries to defend your city if, if it should come to military action. I believe the captain or the general of Cambridge's standing militia, Selena Fairweather, would be a person I could send to negotiate. She is fair, tough, and more than charismatic enough to carry a negotiation. We'll definitely take your advice under cons uh, consideration, Sir Marcus. Just uh, one favor. Uh, don't tell the Lord Fireforge that I was the one who suggested it. Perish the thought. Yeah, he's not really uh, too happy with my relationship with his daughter. <laughs> he has a hearty laugh at that. He goes, a man I can appreciate, after all. Um, Lord Kilsch says, well, you have brought peace and order back to my city. And for that, we are forever grateful. However, I am a stickler for what we originally honored. You did not recover the Dreamstone, such as it is, so I cannot offer you the full reward that I promised you. However, I do promise you something a little bit different. 
I offer you land within my within my uh, city and anything else that is within my power, within reason, of course. I'd rather this information stay on the down low. If there's no official record of you having succeeded or failed, people may assume the dreams, the dreams don't still exist. It's maybe just not working as well. That is rumor I can play off. And we can play off to the gods being fickle. This is going to be an adjustment period at best. So we need some time. Well, if he's offering if he's offering us land as a consolation prize, Jesus, what was the actual reward going to be? A lot of damn money. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, my notes and see if I can. I'm, I'm going to look at my uh, missing right pauldron. and be like, perhaps um, you could recommend an armorer. I seem to be missing some pieces. You're, uh, you have you're... access to my personal armor. I'll oh, probably take I'll probably take you up on that. Your offer of land is generous, but I have a I have a, a greater goal of my own that I have to pursue. So the land would not be useful to me. So if you will instead uh, be willing to offer me a, a, at least a, I can't speak for my companions, but if you could offer me a measure of gold and uh, re, uh, a rebuild of my uh, of my equipment, I would consider that payment enough. He looks. At Lady Kill, she goes, the reason we're offering you land is to keep this off official records. Land can be given and taken, as is my whim. Gold, I have to account for every coin. It's also pretty easy to set up a region, look after the land while you're away. Well, if and, it's... And, and send on any money that it might earn. He, Lord Kill says, your friend raises an excellent point. The land is to do with, with what you will. If you can turn it into a gold-making endeavor, then by all means, that land shall be given to you, as they say, tax-free, as service to this city. And I think you'll find the land that I'm going to give you, or at least the proposed property, to be rather generous. He points to, he pulls out a map of Cambridge and gives you a piece in the nicer district of town. He says, I offer you the Crying Jester. It is an inn that has recently become vacant as the owners. I'm, decided... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are you offering me my own bar? <laughs> I, I think you just convinced him. I take back what I said. Your offer is accepted. Ladies, the drinks are on me. <laughs> oh dear Lord Kills has a laugh along with Lady Gills and they're like the crying jester was recently vacated by its gnomish owners who wish to pursue other interests so uh, I think you'll find the land and its patrons to be rather generous <laughs> all right uh yeah no okay I take it back I will Happily accept uh, the deed to the crying jester. Uh, although, yeah, if I could uh, spend, uh, if I could uh, get the, some help of your armorer, uh, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. <laughs> I own a bar. I own a bar. I'm going to get shit faced. <laughs> we, we own a bar. I was going to say, what's this I thing you keep saying? <laughs> We would also like to be able to retain your services should we re require you in the future. If trouble with Ordo is brewing, and you did mention Orc war, brand, war Bands, we do have a truce with them in the Cloakwood, but I wonder, will that still stand after this most recent incursion? Well, we can deal with that on a contract-by-contract -contract basis, but we don't really do much long-term work, so... Your terms are acceptable. You did do a great service to the city. On the plus side, we now have a free bed for the night. And booze! Free booze! <laughs> I'm so happy! I'm try My character is trying very hard not to cry with happiness at what he's just been awarded. It's not free. It's just using your own stuff. It's a loss of sales. <laughs> don't, don't ruin it for him. <laughs> He's just so thrilled. <laughs> so Lord Kill says, if you do excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I will hopefully see you soon. My court door is always open to you. 
though a little advance notice is always appreciated. And uh, enjoy your new property within the city of Cambridge. Like as I've stated, tax free. I'll give him a little bow. Uh, so your generosity is appreciated, my lord. I will also uh, offer a bow and uh, say that uh, if he ever decide, if he, if and, and say if my lords ever find their way to the crying jester, this round is free. I grab here Marcus by the scruff of the neck and drag him out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you enter back out into the sunshiny uh, main courtyard of Lord Kilsh's estate. Mari is um, sitting outside the room going, well, how'd it go? We own a bar! <laughs> He's very <laughs> excited. <laughs> Are you yeah. there, like doing doing a little jig of happiness? I am weeping. I am on my knees, weeping openly and giving thanks to every god I can name. Is there a god of booze? Oh, I'm going to be worshiping him tonight. <laughs> well, I can think of several the in the, uh, the several gods toilet. in the real world. Dionysus springs to mind immediately. <laughs> Mari looks over at L Lenore. Says, "Your friend seems rather excited by this." idea of inebriation i presume your medical training will take care of him should he get sick to his stomach which will inevitably happen no 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 i'm he going to make to... use of a staggering number of whores tonight just staggering he's going to pay for whatever he does to liver <laughs> <laughs> mari goes and that would be my cue so if you need me you will always find me here hopefully i will see you later as opposed to sooner <laughs> all right so with that ladies uh let's uh let's go take a look at my new bar <laughs> our yes you do look tomato you, tomato you do look down at the deed it does have all three of your names and titles added to it oh what are our titles you are considered landowner most high Ooh, oh, I'm already see. I'm already thinking about some stuff we uh, stuff we can add to the bar. You know, we really need to put in like a card table or something. Get some gambling in oh, there. Get a little no. extra money off the house. You need little, to think about a little extra money it. for the house. Ma Marcus, Marcus, breathe. Maybe a brothel. I don't know. Oh no, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, you can't come off it, you god bothering busybody. We've got a money making gold mine here. Let's make use of it. Come on, in a think, respectful th manner. Think of all think of all the money you'd be able to send home. Which would be tainted by your impropriety. Come on. Hey, hey, to hey. Drink the, try not tainted. to drink the entire bar dry before you get any patrons. Tainted gold spends just as well as clean gold. Oh. <laughs> da, 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 All right, gold. Scarface. Da, 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 da. <laughs> All right, but first things first. We just survived a life or death situation, so I think we can uh, we can afford to I think we can afford uh, to take a to take a sampling of our supply in celebration, as it were. All right, so you make your way through Cambridge proper. You um, make your way towards the crying jester. You notice a woman has set up a flower cart just outside your place, and she uh, looks at the three of you goes, oh, you three must be the new owners. Yep. <laughs> Edley He's very and, happy. Edley and Janessa send their fondest regards. You'll find your welcome packages just inside the door. I'm usually here Monday to Friday. Um, and... Uh, I suppose I'll be eating with you daily. More than welcome to. More than welcome to. All right, let's go take a look at our new bar. All right, so you enter the Crying Jester. It's rather ornate woodwork across its bar. There are several tables, a rather rather large hearth, which is next to a stage where presu pre presumably a bard might play or anybody reciting epic uh, poetry. And it's just a rather nice establishment. Upstairs are about six rooms. Downstairs, there are two nicer rooms. I call the big one. <laughs> there is a rather large basement stocked with whatever supplies would be needed for a place such as this. Fresh linen, um, food, food store, stuff like that. There are what would be the medieval equivalent of a Rolodex. People who you contract out for hunting, fishing, um, liquor supply, stuff like that, the dates at which they come, how much they're typically owed, stuff I'm just, like just, that. I just want to flip through that Rolodex real quick, see if uh, see if any of the Fireforge breweries are contracted. Uh, Fireforge breweries are contracted twice a month. Fireforge Brew does sell here 
on the regular. But oh, we, are gonna, people... we are going to have to double that because I'm going to drink that on my own. <laughs> Need to leave so, yeah. some for the customers. Things seem the place is left in a considerable well order for you. Well, right. you enjoy this, so I'm going to go and find the nearest uh, temple to Tyr or Thorm and um, buy a fuckload of, uh, well, uh, first of all, I'm going to get some beer from the bar uh, and some flowers uh, and take it as an offering to the temple. All right, you do as such. So while you go to the temple, bring your offering, you um, get a voice in your head. Just a gentle voice. It's a woman's voice saying, well done. You fulfilled everything you needed to today. A life was saved. A life was spared. And souls were put to rest. Not much more could be asked of you. You've served me well, Paladin. Continue to do so. And then my voice rings up from the basement. Friend. Let's get bluted! <laughs> He's really excited to be here. <laughs> Lenore, what are you doing besides not getting, you know, blottoed here? Um, I'm going to basically just pick a room, um, kind of clean all my stuff up because I got really, like, real messy uh, over all of this because I was hiding in a closet with bodies at some point. So I'm going to... Like find the bathhouse. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna scrub and sanitize all of my stuff. Um, sort through all of my herbs and spell components, um, and uh, just kind of like kick back for a night. All right. So really okay, you're... hang on. I, I I thought the perfect way to end this. Has Skyblade? Has Alisaria come back from the temple? Not yet. Okay. Y yeah. And, like, this is just for, like, the, like, one night. I'm going to kind of kick back and clean myself up. Um, and, so and as you're... I'm so as like, you're... like, light some incense and say a prayer to pay Lord. All right. So as you're kicking back in your room, having a rather or rather nice bath, because you got one of the nice, uh, dare I say, executive rooms. <laughs> I you're having one. a nice bath. So gross. You hear a knock at the window. Sure. Okay. You knock at the window. <laughs> you see a half orc. He kind of leans in the window. Hi, pretty lady. Let's see. I'm going to. Um... My name is Moom. Jesus. You're covered in soapy soap. I'm, it um, smells real nice in here. Gonna get up out of the bath, slam the window closed. Why you hurt Moom? Oh my god. Um, and go back to my bath unless he's gonna keep making noise. You hear him just singing in the alleyway. He's not bothering anybody. He's just really, really drunk or an idiot. You're not quite sure which. You're not all right, well, I'm going to get a bath towel off and go to where I can't hear that noise. <laughs> you grab a towel, kind of hang in your room with your incense, your flowers, your candles. Yeah, You're feeling true. pretty good. I'm trying to get a night's peace. One night's peace. Are you, are you guys going to open the bar for the night or just have it be your own place? Just have it be our own place for now. Okay, so... Is, 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 all, is all sorry back from the temple yet? Yep. So okay. all three of you are back. Okay, so... I am going to charge into whatever room the two girls are in and go, guys, guys, I just thought of a name for the bar. Uh oh. Because I'm drunk. You're 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 gonna love this. It's it's perfect. Go. It's it's the perfect name. The fools who ride. What do you think? I it's think a, we need to put you to bed. I think the fool is the one who drinks. Yeah. That's what we're gonna call it. The fools who ride. And then, and then I'm just we just watch, pass you watch out. You kind of slowly <laughs> slide to the floor. <laughs> and then I just pass out. <laughs> Are we leaving him there? Um, no, put him in a bed or something. I don't want him on this floor. Okay. <laughs> so, with that, wait, the wait. 
Night passes without incident. You go to bed with full stomachs. You smell clean. Tomorrow is a bright and early Monday morning. The scent of fresh flowers greets you. And that's where our adventure ends for this um, Fools Who Ride. You were successful. You were able to save the town of Cambridge, although the Dreamstone was lost. Cambridge's future is now in its own hands, potentially for the first time in hundreds of years. No longer will it rely on good fortune blessed by the gods. It now has to forge its own path. What will happen with the kingdom of Ordo? Are they as traitorous as they appear? Is it just a splinter cell? Will the orcs um, adhere to the truce that had been um, upheld with them in the Cloakwood? What about the druids in the Cloakwood? Where's Thera? So many questions to answer. So many answers. And I'll tell you, in our debrief, uh, which will be following up next here on Who's Who Ride the Dreamstone. And then we'll talk a little bit about Season 2 and some ideas that we may be having for this. So for Dungeons and Dragons, the Dreamstone, Fools Who Ride, or however you want to put that, whatever order you want, we have been... Dr. Gonzo. The Cat. And Skyblade. I've been your game master for this wonderful adventure. I've been Mike the Birdman Dodson. I hope you always roll a natural 20. Welcome back, my fellow adventurers. It is I, your game master slash storyteller, Mike the Birdman Dodd from ThisWeekInGeek.net. And I am joined with my crew of fellow adventurers here on the Nerd to the Third uh, Powers actual play D&D podcast, Fools Who Ride the Dreamstone. This is the debrief where we kind of analyze, look, uh, think back, and kind of what we liked, what we didn't like, where we want things to go, and maybe talk a little bit about the future of this particular project here. Uh, but I am joined around the table, starting in the West Coast with... I am the cat, and are we still introducing our characters? Because we're actually... Uh, yeah, sure, why not? moment. So I have been playing Lenore Longfellow, a level three human plague doctor cleric. And of course, it uh, wouldn't be Nerd the Third Power without our internet radio DJ. Sky Blaze. Um, I was playing Alisaria Sunshadow, a level three high elf paladin. And finally, we round things out with our resident master of ceremonies of the Nerd to the Third Powers podcast proper. Uh, Dr. Gonzo, and I was playing Marcus Hawk, a level three human knight. So over the course of the last 14, 15 weeks, we have been walking through you through this adventure through Faerun and the Forgotten Realms. This is a Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition campaign that I more or less came up with um, with Gonzo, Cat, and Skyblaze. Um, they gave me their character ideas. I came up with the storyline <clears throat> kind of over the course of a couple of days. But um, a lot of this was fired from the hip. It was very improv uh, which is sort of my style of game mastering. If you're familiar with some of the work I did with thisweekingeek.net and uh, terriblewarriors.com back in the day, um, a lot of my campaigns, they're planned out to be long form. This would be the second longest running campaign I've done, the longest being the original Cambridge Chronicles, which ran back and concluded in 2018, which was 37 episodes, um, which ended in a total party wipe. Oof. because of stupidity um let's just say people got bad roles at bad times and stick together um and putting this one together was a lot of fun because uh cat for example is a veteran role player she's a big fan of critical role so that for me as a game master was a lot to live up to because everybody s's the d of matt mercer um <laughs> so i'm like how the hell am i gonna match this guy um skyblaze who's definitely given me the idea that she's a veteran role player across uh various systems 
So I'm thinking, all right, got to make sure I know what the hell I'm talking about week to week, moment to moment. And then finally, Gonzo, who'd only done some Warhammer 40K at some point, but had never done Dungeons and Dragons proper. And since D&D has never been more popular than an than pretty much ever i mean even in its tsr days back in the 80s and 90s it was super popular but not so much where it where it had penetrated the mainstream and you had stars like joe Mang- manganello stephen colbert wesley snipes vin diesel etc cetera, etc cetera, talking about the property openly and how much they love it this was the undertaking to give gonzo not only a premiere in my opinion dungeons and dragons experience but something that felt authentic to the world and its aesthetic so um i'm gonna go around the table start with cat end with gonzo what did you guys think of the campaign overall? I mean, overall, it was pretty fun. Um, this, to me, was what I would call a shorter campaign. Um, so this might be the longest you've ever run, but this is one of the shortest I've ever played. Um, well, so- my longest is 37, so this is my second longest. Because um, I'm in I'm in like weekly games so that I've been playing for like a year. Mm-hmm. So, like, the amount of hours that we put in is is a lot. And I'm used to doing things like leveling up and, and having a lot of time to take long rests. So a lot of it it, it, it was a little bit of struggle at times because we didn't always have the chance to do a long rest before we go into battle and get our spells back and stuff like that. Um, and it all took place over a short amount of time. Um, so there... I, when I play, I enjoy like a lot of role playing. And so, because it was so, um, I guess, truncated and, you know, it wasn't meant to be like a super long play game that we didn't have as much time as I personally would have liked for playing um, or or delving into as much with character backstories and stuff like that, because that's the aspect of the role playing game that I really super enjoy. Uh, but overall, it was pretty fun. Um, there was a lot of, ah, danger, ah, just being nervous about um, whether or not we were in uh, the, 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 the right situation for our character sets. <laughs> um, because I think when we had set out, um, like, we didn't really talk too much about what we wanted to play. Um, so walking in with the paladin and the cleric was, um, maybe a little excessive, but it worked out. But it was probably a little excessive. It probably could have branched out into um, not having two people who could do healing and instead getting a, another caster or something like that in there. Um, but we did all right. We did all right. We didn't die much. Except for that one time where Mike didn't read the stat block, right? <laughs> yep, and I will get to that. <laughs> that was a fun episode to record. You say yes. fun. Half half the trailer came from that episode. <laughs> oh, God. All right. So I guess uh, moving right along, uh, Skyblaze, what did you think? Um, yeah, I, I thought it was pretty fun. Um, the times when we did get to do the, the like serious role playing stuff was was fun. Um, me using Child Divinity to strike down Pazuzu very early on. I was like, I did not expect that to work. But um, I guess because I I put some role-playing effort into it, that's what what pushed it over the line into actually functioning. And you actually got a shout-out on Twitter for it. I did, which was rather nice. Thank you to that person. I forgot who that was, but thank you to that person. Um, Also, uh, when Gonzo as Marcus was uh, pleading with... uh, the guy to, to turn away from the darkness. That was really nice. I know you were saying that you were like not sure about all of this, uh, Gonzo, but I think you did a, a really good job for somebody who's not used to doing that sort of thing. I had no idea that was going to work. I was just like, look, if I bum rush this guy, everybody's going to die. So fuck it. Let's just go out of the box. Yeah, stuff like that is really nice. It's one of the nice things about role playing is when you do actually like not just look at the numbers on on the sheet. You actually think, how would these people react? Really, how what could you say to someone? What to change their mind? Uh, and stuff like that is is one of the like Kat said. It's one of the things I really enjoy about role playing. Um, 
yeah, the party was a bit unbalanced, but after having only three of us, I'm not sure if that's actually avoidable. Because um, ideally, we'd need like a rogue or, as Kat said, a, a spellcaster of some some description who wasn't a cleric. But with only three of us, that's hard to do. Um, the pacing was very, very fast. Um, possibly could have benefited from more downtime, as it were. Uh, but there are advantages and disadvantages to that approach. And I think most of that comes down to the podcast format. You want yeah. every hour to be exciting as opposed to, okay, we're going to spend this hour shopping because I always hated that when I played shatter or vampire, the masquerade, we would run into that issue, but yeah, I definitely pacing is something I'm, I'm going to address. Mm. Yeah. All right. So moving on to Gonzo, this is your first D and D proper experience. What did you think? Yeah, I've got kind of a, kind of a unique perspective on on this, uh, not just because this was my first uh, actual Dungeons and Dragons campaign, but also because I'm also the one who's got to edit these things to post <laughs> them up. So I, I I get to list, I get to 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 deal with it both as a as a newbie player and as an experienced uh, show editor. Um, as far as the campaign itself, I mean, I had a I had a blast with it. Um, I, 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 it's definitely made a believer uh, out of me, and I've got you know now a few sets of dice to to roll with. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm probably not going to buy any more because I don't have the dragon sickness like Cat does. <laughs> uh, one of us, one of us, one of us. Um, I, I enjoyed the the role playing bits. I was kind of a little disappointed that I though that I didn't get to see a whole lot more, uh, get to see much more combat than I did. I think I only got into into two real scuffles. Um. Both of which I, I I really didn't enjoy with the with the you, you said they were whites for those yes. for those things okay yes see all right so the, that that's 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 the one thing that I have an unabashed complaint about I've never liked damage sponge enemies in video games and I I found that I'm not too much more fond of them here uh, in Dungeons and Dragons because like you know I, I the, the the whole time I I realized that you put them in our way for to be a challenge and for dramatic effect but the whole time we were fighting i was just getting frustrated and i was like look we're hitting this with with every trick in the book with everything we have and we're just not even doing anything and i found myself getting more frustrated than 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 feeling challenged um i think i think part of the issue with that is you're not reading the damn stat block <laughs> no know when to run because everybody assumes in D and D everything is there to be killed, and that's not always the case. Because enemies sometimes that are intelligent will run. Enemies that are undead sometimes you don't have the tools to take to take those on. That's why I kept trying to give you hints like you're doing massive amounts of damage, but it's not really hurting them. Run, trip them up, and yes, that will take away from you gaining experience. But I've never liked doing experience via traditional levels. I'll just you achieved a milestone. You've done so many cool things. Here you go. Gain a level. So um, when you're fighting, as you so eloquently put it, Captain Howdy, um, you fought smart. The first time you fought one, you knocked him down in the mud and he got stuck. That well, was that, smart. I, re I remember that being more of an accident, which really applies to a lot of things that I did uh, in this in this in this campaign a lot of it was me just tr just like all right let's just throw this to the wall and see what it sticks quite literally in the case of dealing with the gorgon yep yeah the gorgon was meant to be a tougher foe challenge rating wise i don't know whether you could have beat him he was put there mostly as an obstacle say how smart of you if you charge in you're fucking dead i don't feel sorry for you but if you're smart and outthink me, that's why the Gorgon in his in his in, in in his flavor text they describe sickly Gorgons as looking like they're rusted. So that's yeah, why I, I'm was, thinking was was that Gorgon actually blind? Because I got the impression that it was. No, that was something. As a game master, you should always be listening to your 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 players because occasionally they'll come up with more shit that's brilliant than what you're thinking. So when they think they figured something out. Me as the game master looks brilliant because I'm like, oh, yes, you've fallen exactly for the plan I wanted you to. And I'm thinking, they're bl the Gorgon's blind. I like that. Sounds cool. Roll with it. And it just it worked out nice. I liked the way you did it. And having the Gorgon hunt you by sound and smell worked out really, really, really well. Yeah. Um, 
uh, the, the 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 pacing uh as as far as the pacing goes this is where i have to slip in editor mode uh there were some moments where i i, I kind of got a little frustrated that we kept on second guessing ourselves um and that kind of dragged things out a little bit um and i i kind of worried sometimes like you know are the listeners going to really like this like and that's kind of why i kind of spoke up uh in the the finale episodes like okay let's not have a whole episode where we're just planning let's pick something and go um, cause I felt like, I don't know, maybe that, maybe that's just a normal thing in D and D in a, in a, in a long form session, but I kind of felt like there was a lot of times where we just kept second guessing ourselves and going around in circles. Well, that's the difference between recording for a podcast and, rec- and playing for yourself. If you're playing mm. for yourself, planning is very, very important, but if you're playing to entertain, then you have to think of pacing. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's not just D and D that does things, um, I have had great entertainment as a GM watching my players tie themselves into incredibly intricate knots trying to figure out what the hell X meant when I just put it in as a random thing of flavor. Yeah, same here. Like, right. So you're going to spend like an entire session figuring out what the hell this means. It doesn't mean anything. But I guess it does now. <laughs> yeah, so, but there is called Sorry, analysis paralysis, where we're sitting around trying to figure out the perfect plan when in reality, the perfect plan doesn't exist. Mm. There, there's just, my experience with D&D is that no matter what you do, it's going to fail. No matter how well you The play. dice will fuck you up. Yeah, so like my dice- fuck Yeah, cat, cat's dice are smoking cigarettes right now. Because <laughs> like, they, they fucked her hard. Uh, so like really like there was one whole combat session that I rolled once above a 10 which is yeah, really you're bad shit. because you know you can do that shit at higher levels when you have much larger modifiers on things but when you have like a plus two to hit and you keep rolling threes you're not hitting anything and it's even worse as a spellcaster because I'm expending spell slots as I'm not hitting things and going into the final round of combat, I was just biting my nails over not having enough spells left. You know, just going, oh god, if we have to fight, I've got three spells and one ability, and then it's nothing but my mace. And just going, oh god, oh god, oh god, what do I want to do? What do yeah, I, I was, do? I was really awful about keeping track of my spell slots. But as far as my first campaign goes, I mean, I had, I, I had an absolute blast. Aside from, like I said, I don't like the damage sponge enemies. Um, yeah. I really like. I didn't expect the trick with the gorgon to work. I really didn't expect the the whole appeal to reason with Clovis at the end to work. That was that was just like I said. That was just you know me swinging for the fences and expecting it to fail. I had no idea that was going to work. In in my home game, you would have been rolling persuasion checks the whole time, and I don't know if if uh, Mike, if you had like your own checks that you were doing on your end or if you were just rolling with nope. it just pure in the moment role play like p- persuasion checks are fine for a guard or general npc but if you're gonna confront your big bad i want you to live in that moment i want you as the player to come through i want to see your 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 emotional intelligence i want to see how you are able to read people and I want you to be a person than a collection of of numbers. Yes, the collection of numbers is important, but if you're able to reach me as a person, you're more likely to succeed. And that's why I've always described my style of role-playing as more cinematic. With me, you get movies of the week, or at least direct to DVD. Um, Occasionally (laughs) a blockbuster. Um, I'm the canon films of role-playing games. Um, And... I want you to experience something a little bit more than, yay, I rolled a nat 20, as opposed to having an emotional conversation. I don't know whether you guys caught it. When I was when Gonzo and I were doing the back and forth between him and Clovis and the family saying goodbye to Clovis. Yeah, it sounded like you were like breaking down. I was I like, did. Is, is this motherfucker crying? I did. Did Aww. did 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 you two catch that? Uh, I, I thought you were, your voice was breaking a bit, but I wasn't sure if that was like being in character or. Yeah, actually... I actually got into it. Uh, I've actually, I've it. done that to my players before. Um, at the end of 
I've actually done that to my husband, although we uh, were we even dating at the time? Well, we, we, before we were even dating, um, at the end of one of the campaigns where a copy of a character's sister uh, was actually saved from, because uh, in the original continuity she died, and uh, he managed to save her this time. And he actually, like, broke down. Uh, and yeah, I was like, I, I'm not sure if I should be proud of myself or feel a bit guilty, or both. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah. that's role playing for you. Sometimes you can just lose yourself in the characters. Yeah, like with me, I want to give you an emotional experience. To me, role playing, and this this is going to sound weird, but I'm a very much an emotional vampire with it. In I'm going to feel, and I want you to feel with me like stories to me should be more than just celebrating small victories of random chance. I want your victories to come from a very emotional place from a place that you can measure if emotion can be measured. But I feel the more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. And especially with, with, with Gonzo, this is your first time. This is your first universe in universe experience with it. And I wanted you to resonate. I wanted things to really stick with you later. Um, and was your decision good or bad? And ultimately, yeah, you saved Clovis. He did turn around what he was going to do. You spoke to his, you turned him enough away from the dark side, realizing he was willing to sacrifice himself to bring his family back, realizing he may not be the man that they love anymore, but they'd be alive. And you got through to him realizing maybe what he's doing is wrong. That maybe making that huge sacrifice to bring them back wouldn't be right. Um, and I really wanted that to stick with, with you guys as PCs and as people as well. Cause part of this, I tell these stories to be, emotional to myself as well. This is a form of emotional therapy for me. And I want it to not be a life lesson, but to tell a story that will matter. And I'm a very big fan of choice and consequence. Um, Cause every decision you make, no matter how small ripples and making a pretty big decision is what, what would you give up for the one that you love? Even if they were taken away um, unfairly is a question that has been th th played throughout fiction for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, and I want you guys to think about that too. Like, what would you do? You can have a loved one back, but you give up yourself, but they will be back. Life ever, life everlasting, whereas you yourself will be gone. Can you make that hard choice? And in Clovis's mind, he was doing the right thing. He thought he'd be doing the right thing for a baby girl who had never really lived, a wife who had loved him no matter what. And maybe I could have explored that relationship more, but that's something you see through movies, television, and novels where you see a perspective from the villain. So I wonder if I could have fleshed Clovis out a little bit better because he was essentially a non-participant until the very end. You knew his motivations that he wanted to bring his family back, but it wasn't until those final conversations you kind of got a a feel for who he was, but that's maybe the failing of the podcast narrative and maybe myself as a storyteller. Am I a good GM? I'm an interesting one. I don't know whether I call myself good. Um, so um, I'm trying to think of what else well, pacing. Oh, sorry. Gonzo, go ahead. Well, I can, I can tell you, I wasn't, I wasn't sitting here stacking dice, which I'm told is the, is, is the, the, the sign of death for a campaign. <laughs> yeah like i want you to always be thinking engaged and you guys were always talking back and forth so the camaraderie between you three was really good and you did mention something about party balance i'm glad your party wasn't balanced because one of the things that's always bugged me about modern role playing is everybody's always worried about balance is it balanced not everything in life necessarily is you play what you want and we'll worry about it later um, I'm not saying walking into a cave with three fighters is a great idea because none of you have healing abilities, but you know what? You can supplement that with, with like potions or, uh, spell scrolls, you know, shit like that. There are ways to get around it. Um, 
but they're not, there are always an imperfect solution in an imperfect world. When, when I was talking about balance, I wasn't really talking about the MMO, because a lot of, of fourth ed D and D did this as a reason. One of the reasons why I'm not hugely fond of uh, fourth ed is it did the MMO thing, the tank DPS uh, healer split. Mm -hmm. And that's nonsense for D&D &D and um, in role-playing in general, because it doesn't really work. The party balance I meant was um, more in the case of certain skill sets we were missing, things like a rogue could pick locks and check traps. Um, a spellcaster yeah, like to, yeah, to, to, mm -hmm. to send messages uh, remotely and things like that. And the fact that we were all in heavy armor, there was no one to do any sneaking and scouting. Certain yeah. skill sets were missing from the part. And it's not insurmountable, but it does make things a bit tricky for the yeah, GM like, and for us. Yeah, like I'm checking for traps, the best we could do is poke the chest for mimics. I'm not a fan of having the archetypal, like you have to have a warrior, a healer, a rogue, and a ranger. I don't feel like that is a necessity for every campaign. But I do like when when I've played with other people, we do adjust our our character concepts based around, okay, that person's gonna play a fighter, so I don't need to play a fighter now. And we take the character that we want to play and adjust them to a different class. So like um my my thinking from the outset of this game was I want to play a cleric, and it's because I haven't played a, a cleric in a long time. Um, and then Skyblaze came in and said, hey, I'm going to be a paladin. And I'm like, okay, they're just different enough. But we really did suffer from not having a rogue. Because yeah. the rogue skill set is really, really useful. Yeah, another thing that really impacted how the, how the party wound up turning out was when me and Skyblaze actually made characters, we coordinated uh, on our character build outs and our backstory. So something that didn't, that kind of got hinted at in, in our dialogue between us is by this point in, 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 in our characters lives, they'd been adventuring together for some time and had known each other for a while. Um, cause we coordinated our backstories to, to basically come from the similar area and kind of be, be looking for similar things. Um, and, Cat kind of made her character out on her own, so I, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think in hindsight, I would have had all three of us kind of powwow to plan out our characters so that there was a little more synergy in the creation process. Uh, there right are now, advantages in having a character yeah. building session together. Well, the there are disadvantages as well, but there are. There, the, the other thing is, is that if you're playing a really play heavy story, um, which this ended up not being um, to a certain extent that um, you might not want everyone to know your backstory. You mm. might want to have that private so that you can have really good role playing to discover one another's backstories. So I didn't do a planning session with everybody to go, here's what my backstory is. How are we all related to one another? Or how do we all know each other? I didn't want to have that because I wanted something that was something to be discovered. And since we didn't end up playing super heavy role play sessions, that we ended up not being able to delve into that. Because it, again, with a with a short campaign, you don't always get the chance to do it, and we could not make the time for it. So it's just an unfortunate thing. I have an it's something for us to work on. Yeah, Incidentally, uh, if we do use these characters again, they are getting leveled up, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I would. <laughs> <laughs> Probably lever you up to level five, me. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I think level five is pretty fair. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a world I'd like to come back. I think I left you enough plot threads. If you wanted to follow up to it, we definitely could. Um, I mean, overall, I'm relatively pleased with how well this turned out over the course of the last 14 or so uh, episodes. Like I said, this is the second longest uh, long form game that I've run for a podcast. So I'm rather pleased, although every game that I've run has been Dungeons and Dragons based. And um, my knowledge of D&D &D is I know the rules enough to make it work fairly well. And this is where we talk about some of my failings. Some things I have to constantly reference and I'm noticing this as I'm getting older and I don't, I really hope it's not a side effect of, of my medication, um, is I'm getting mental fog on certain things. I'm not as sharp as I used to be. 
So I have to constantly relook up things, how this works, how that works. Um, I, when I, I killed I, Cat, I know that feeling. Yeah, I know that feeling. When I killed Cat in that one episode, that was totally on me. I misread a stat block, um, and I wasn't comprehending it properly. And it made for a great dramatic moment. Great comedic moment. <laughs> yeah, that what was something I'll never quite forget. Um from her i don't think i've ever seen her get that angry in all the time i've known her <laughs> um yeah i have been but it, it's because i knew that like no this is wrong this is this is not like we wouldn't be facing an enemy that could do that and have that skill at our level like this is i don't know this... there are some enemies who can do that but it's under a very specific set of circumstances and that's right. where i fucked up i didn't give you those very specific specific set of circumstances right that's why i immediately knew that this was wrong and then after we went um on our break we were like okay let's reread this okay no that's not right <laughs> yeah so part of a good gm and this is um a, a skill that i've learned in the years is yes the gm say is final but the gm should be flexible you should always be willing to listen to feedback as it's happening if you've made a mistake yeah rewind a few seconds or or give a dramatic reason as to why something is happening like with the whites for example how they were damaged spongy i misread something again about damage and we said okay you are dealing full damage if it's radiant it's just delayed and i'm thinking okay that works within the context of this and they could be powered by pazuzu so why not it sounds cool um so yeah that's totally a fuck up on my behalf and i know someone will call me out in the comments but i'm always wanting to learn and evolve as i go and dnd is surprisingly not the world i'm the most comfortable with because in D D, especially Forgotten Realms, which is written by Ed Greenwood in the 80s, it has such a history and such a legacy behind it. I want to do it justice, and I don't think I ever have, because there's a lot to take in. Like, Cambridge in d d does not exist. It's just a place that I made up. And, of course, d d they always say it's a, it's a whole world. Make it up. Do what you want. But there are places like Neverwinter, Baldur's Gate, um, um... Water deep, the Sword Coast itself. Um, there are other places within Faerun. Yeah, that's only true if you use Faerun Forgotten Realms. You can actually just make a place up from scratch. And that's the problem. Like I, I, I I've, I, there, there is. I've, I've always felt making your own place up from scratch is the easy way out. I always felt by, by placing it firmly in a world, you can look at a map of Faerun. And I, since I was using things like here is the Cloakwood, you can look on a map and give a rough idea where Cambridge might be. Like it's about a couple days travel from Waterdeep. It's near the Cloakwood. It's on the Sword Coast. So you have a rough idea where it might be. And I just add in random geographical kind of details. Then when Gonzo threw me threw me the ideas for Clan Fireforge and uh, I made up Ordo, I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to worry about those geographically right now. If I need to, I'll think about that in the moment. Um, which is another thing um, I've always kind of prided myself upon this is I have a notebook very thankfully provided by the good folks at Insight Editions. You should go visit them. Um, they gave me a Skyrim notebook when I got a Skyrim cookbook last year. And I take all my Dungeon Master notes into it. And I wrote out six to ten pages for this campaign. Guess how many pages I actually followed? Two. Two. Three. Nah. Ev everything else made up in the moment. Um, I've never been a guy to follow published adventures um they're useful for maps they're useful for npcs and sometimes they're just good reads they're just a cool adventure you get to read through like storm king's thunder or curse of strahd or descent into um Avernus, which has mad max medieval vehicles in it which is really weird um, so, what was, so what was the point where we went off the rails uh let me consult my notes and i will tell you so talk amongst yourselves for like 30 seconds <laughs> So I think we were talking about um, wanting to to do some more role playing, not necessarily D and D, but other other campaigns. And I said that I might be willing to GM a session because I know Mike wants to play instead of run for a change. 
Uh, would well, you guys be interested in in uh, being my little minion? Uh, perhaps. Uh, going back to to what you guys were saying earlier about wanting to do something that's a little more role play heavy, um, something that I threw out uh, in one of our discussions off air was the idea of like you know we like you and I, Skyblaze, had coordinated and given our characters backstory where they knew each other. I'd like to kind of maybe do like a prequel story where we show how our characters, how all our characters came together and met for the first time. Um, and kind of explore those backstories. Um, so I think that might be fun. I don't know how we'd reconcile the experience gain we got from this campaign, but you know that's 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 a bridge we'll cross when we get to it. Wibbly it could wobbly be... timey wimey. Yep. Um. So I I look back at my notes. You guys went off the rails at hour three when you hit when you hit the island where the pirates and the smugglers were. Mm. That's where things took. A turn. I looked at my dungeon I designed for Clovis. It was a lot more fucking deadly. Like I had traps. I had gelatinous cube traps. Yeah. The nope. rust monster I threw in at the last minute because I thought they'd be cool, and I decided to play them more like um, xenomorphs because I don't know. I'm on this huge like alien kick right now. Um. So. Um. Oh yeah, I have stats for the Terminator and the Predator too. Um. I just never use them. Um, but yeah. At least, like, at least you didn't use the stats for the horrible ghost. I have stats for him. I have stats for Shaggy. And I have stats for like, a, like a, but I, I have stats for the fucking Kool-Aid man somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've always really dumb green. There's stat blocks that exist for all the crystal gems from Steven Universe as well that I've seen. Like, like D and D's fun, um, and as Gonzo and you did just mention Skyblaze, maybe we'll branch out into other things because, um, as much as I love D and D, I wonder if I'm D and D'd out. And I've and we just kind of hinted at. I've always been the forever GM. I get to play not as much as I'd like, but I'm discovering through you guys, especially, I'm not beholden to any expectations through you guys. Like I have been with some of, them, of my previous projects and I'm, that's not me shit talking them. It's just, I feel less pressure here. I'm more willing to have fun, especially with cat. Um, I like how you bring the critical role eye to it and you bring the, the need and want to role play. I don't always have to give you razzle dazzle as long as I scratch the itch sky blaze. I feel with you, you are willing to explore different options like, Hey, we haven't done X before. You haven't played X. This sounds fascinating. And with Gonzo, the world is so new and open to you that you have, you have the heart of a role player. You just have to learn when to shut up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, don't interrupt your GM. Cat was going to bit slap you at one point. Um, well, I mean, she wants to do that on a daily basis anyway, but <laughs> yeah, but I also like being able to get a word into a conversation ever. Yeah. So I'm kind of have a vibe how you people work. And I really want to see, especially now that I've seen how Gonzo works, I want to see how cat will work given the same sit, sit situation. And I tried to do it at one point with Thera and I sensed a little bit of uncomfortableness. So I'm like, okay, back and off a touch. Yeah, go figure. Your local asexual doesn't like to be flirted with. See, I didn't know that as a person. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm just going to see how it goes. Because I always want to present an interesting and fleshed out world. And I figure, you know, bisexuality is a thing. Why not? Um, but I didn't know you were asexual. So that's on me. Um, <laughs> so didn't mean nothing by it. Um but I wanted to make it interesting and role playing should take you to new and exciting places. Obviously don't do anything around your table that will make anybody uncomfortable. That's just the rule these days. Don't be a douchebag. Um, so I've learned things about you as players and people that now I know how to approach things from henceforward. 
Um, so I hope that's a lesson that I can take forward into the future. And that's where we're going to talk about things right now. So I'm going to talk and then I'm going to throw things to Skyblaze to give her pitch for season two of Fools Who Ride. And we'll just kind of see where it goes. So obviously it's a big year for pop culture IPs. For those of you um, who've seen some of the pictures I've posted over the years, I'll even send a picture to, to Gonzo if he wants. I'll take a I'll take a picture of my I think I've got a picture of my role play shelf that I can send you. Um, I have access to many, many games games and that's many 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 universes and i want to explore new ones with you perhaps and i'm even developing one not officially with a per with a developer but i'm working on a, a campaign setting that they're very in interested in so here's my ideas for season two um we just finished star wars it's been a very big year we've had the mandalorian clone wars is going on right now the rise of skywalker the less we say the better um but it's a cool universe. Everybody loves Star Wars. I don't need to explain to you wor word one about Star Wars. Um, so there's possibilities there. A system I would probably use for it is I wouldn't use the Fantasy Flights game system because it does use unique dice. That's a whole new system I, I have to learn. And I do have access to a lot of my West End games books digitally because I do have them all physical and I carry around an iPad anyway. Um so they would be fairly easy for me to walk you through character creation. Plus, everybody likes West End Games D6. It's a very easy system to learn. It's powered everything from Ghostbusters to Men in Black. Is that um, the one where you need, like, 50,000 D6? No, I you don't often encounter anything more than 15D, but that's only if you're ludicrously powerful for fairly low-level campaigns. I've never seen anything above, like, 8. Um, okay. So fun combat, there's ship combat. It seems more cinematic. It captures the flavor of Star Wars remarkably well. But then again, you run into the age-old question, all Jedi or no Jedi? Why is Han Solo hanging out with Luke Skywalker sort of thing, right? When Luke can just cut a, cut a person up with his lightsaber, Han can just blast a guy. Luke can blast the bolt away and throw a laser sword at somebody. Luke has more options. Um... But then again, you look at a character like, say, HK-47 from Knights of the Old Republic, and he sets people on fire. Um, and Jedi can't block that shit. So there are ways ar ar around that as well. Um, another game I would love to play, I just need to find the perfect group to do it in, is Doctor Who. And that's done by uh, Cubicle 7, which has currently just released its 12th Doctor source mm -hmm. book. And Series 13 just ended a little while ago. We won't get a new series until New Year's or Christmas. So it's going to be a little bit. Um, and Doctor Who's a series I'm afraid to run because it the person who plays the Doctor, if it even is a Doctor-focused campaign, can be very, very, very pivotal. Um, like, do you, do you make it your own? Do you take on a new persona? Are you just a new time Lord who happens to have their own TARDIS traveling around time and space? Um, there's Daleks, Cybermen, Zygons, Jadoon, uh, like all sorts of weird monsters. And there's the historical part of it that makes it very, very fascinating. And the problem is capturing the flavor of it. And I've always had a really cool idea for Doctor Who to set it during the end of the First World War and insert a little bit of Canadian history into it. And it would be a Christmas episode. So maybe if we do Fools Who Ride Around Christmas, I'll give you my Christmas episode that happens with Anne of Green Gables. Um, <laughs> I have a really cool idea and I can't tell you much more than that without giving it away. Um, and then finally, this is a system that kind of ties into D and D, but not exactly. So, um, if you've been following any of my social media over the last couple of months, cause I presume this will come out much, much, much later. Um, I've been currently, I'm writing a paper on Harry Potter and I'm approaching it like a college thesis where I'm writing about the emotional intelligence and the journey of the hero <clears throat> and my own personal growth as I experience all seven movies and all of the books throughout Harry Potter and I'm examining it and I came across something called Wands and Wizards which is a conversion for D&D 5th edition which takes you to Hogwarts and you play a young wizard set before the time of Harry Potter or just afterwards. And I had this really, really, really great idea. And I even pitched it to, to the developers and they're like, 
oh God, please keep us involved. I've actually posted it a bunch of times on Reddit and I get a bunch of responses to it. So the idea that I created for it was what if after the an initial defeat of Voldemort in 1981, well, what happens to the world? This is the 1980s. This is the fall of the Berlin Wall. This is the rise of consumerism. This is new Coke, Sony Watt. Sony Walkmans, the police, Billy Idol. Like this is Britain in the, the, the 1980s. Things are changing, right? So it's a whole new world to experience. People are resting easy. The Dark Lord's been, you know, defeated. The Ministry of Magic is still in control. What would a group of kids be like that walked around in acid wash jeans, had Cindy Lauper hair, and were just rebellious teenagers who happened to have access to Patronus charms and liquid luck? There is so much possibility here because literally I was looking at a Harry Potter quiz and I happened to hear Journey Separate Ways at, at the same time and, inspira and inspira inspiration struck. And I started writing down ideas for something I called neon wands. <laughs> and I'm totally developing the idea into a full campaign setting for wands and wizards. It's going to take me the better part of a year to do it because I'm approaching it like an old school shadow run source book where I want to write fluff material, setting material and make it interesting because you think about it because just because Voldemort's dead does not mean his, his followers aren't reconsolidating his power. They're trying to figure it out. Hogwarts may not be as secure as people think there's always problems with defense against the dark arts there's always monsters in the dungeon the possibilities for role for role play are endless and it's a world that i'm really really into and everybody knows harry potter fairly well and as players i can introduce you as i i Playing a first-year student might be a little weird because you're only like 11, but if you look at another more contemporary role-playing game, Tales from the Loop, which takes place in the 80s that essentially never was, you also take a role of a kid on a bicycle. Your flashlight could be a lightsaber or a proton blaster. So there's so many possibilities for adventure there. And then I saw this come up in our comments on YouTube or on Facebook. Somebody want us, wanted us to take on the world of darkness. And while there is a new game, uh, the Empire of the Va Masquerade 5th Edition, I personally don't care for the rules. I like some of the ideas, but I don't care for the rules. Um, I would set us up um in a city that maybe all of us know or don't know as a new vampire pack and maybe play out the um politics of the of the camarilla versus um the sabbat you'd have the hunters the newly imbued one of my favorite role play settings is the time of judgment where the world basically comes to an end in a rather spectacular fashion um, there's werewolf, there's mage, the awakening, or I think that was ascension, the, the, the ascension. Yeah. Um, Ascent, uh, the, the awakening was, uh, the, the next edition and was terrible. Yeah. That's what I'd heard. I just couldn't remember which was which, um, yes. werewolf is a game I've always been a big fan of, but it's a world you have to invest a lot of time in learning the lore. Mm. Whereas D and D is easy. It's just, there's magic, there's monsters, there's elves and hobbits and shit. It's pretty easy to figure out. So with all what? that being said, Skyblaze said she wanted to pitch a game. I've actually got a few ideas. There's a, a whole bunch of stuff I've been batting around for ages. Um, you mentioned Doctor Who. Uh, I've actually also got those same source books uh, and a couple of um, supplementary materials. I'm also an enormous Doctor Who nerd, nerd uh, to the point where I have several friends who have written professionally for Doctor Who in book, cool. audio and TV form. So if I need supplementary material and clarification about anything from them, I can get it. The thing I have done before when it comes to Doctor Who and seems to work very well is to not have the Doctor in the game and to have everybody instead playing companions. Okay. Uh, I have actually had a thing where you can pick any companion and I will come up with some bullshit why we're all in the same place at the same time. I like it. 
Uh, and that one tends to be quite fun. I've done that a couple of times for um, uh, one-off sessions. So that one that can usually be resolved within um, three or four sessions. Um, the other thing I would like to do is a uh, thing called Humblewood, which is a um, D and D fifth edition supplement. I don't know what would it be called. Adventure module? I don't know. Um, but the idea behind Humblewood is that you are playing um, birds and forest creatures. So foxes and mice and hedgehogs and owls and crows and all that sort of business. Um, only you're also adventurers. And uh, there's an entire, like, it was Kickstarter. There's an entire module that you can read. And I've I contributed to the Kickstarter, so I can share all the relevant material with you guys if you're interested in that one. Uh, there's another D&D thing that I wanted to do, which is basically uh, Asmodeus shows up on your doorstep and says, uh, a book has gone missing. It's a very important book. It's the Book of Sins. And if you get it back for me, I'll make sure that all of your names are removed from it. So basically retrieving the naughty list from for Santa Claus. A little bit more serious than that, but yes. There's also a whole <laughs> bunch of backstory involving a war against the dragons and the dragons being mostly wiped out. And that is that is relevant. <laughs> uh, what was the other one? Oh yeah, it's Speaking World of Darkness. A thing I wanted to do for ages but could not find a good reason to do it um, was a World of Darkness game where finding a reason why, like, uh, mages and vampires and werewolves and hunters would even be in the same room at the same time. And the idea was if the technocracy, who were the quote unquote big bad, or, uh, well, for mostly for mages, but for most of the world of darkness, um, had basically got an abyssal, a demon, and clamped it in armor and then said, this is a giant mecha that we are going to use for various peaceful purposes and not to destroy the world of darkness, honest girl. So yeah, it's basically World of Darkness meets Neon Genesis Evangelion. Weird, I like it. So, if any of those appeal to you, please let me know. Uh, that also goes for the audience. If you guys would like to hear any of these, or if you want more details about any of these, uh, let me know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, one of the big things I'm hoping Fools Who Ride does is increase audience participation. Get you guys involved because uh, Gonzo puts a lot of effort into editing these. We obviously put a lot of effort into planning and playing, and we want to definitely hear from you guys to put together our next um, adventure set. I have no problem GMing because you guys are so new to me. I'm really having fun with you guys, and having fun role role-playing to me it hasn't, it's been elusive the last couple of years. With you guys, I'm genuinely engaging it. I'm not dreading it like I have before. And maybe that's because my nerves have finally come into a good place where they are. Maybe I'm just in a good space mentally. But um, I've got a good feeling about it. And the idea, the very thought that I don't have to be a forever GM is kind of nice. But at the <laughs> same time, stretching those creative legs again to be creative is enjoyable as well because for years on twig i'd said i'm not a storyteller and as i get older and talk with more people maybe i am and i'm not saying that to be arrogant but it just seems to be the universe keeps nudging me in this direction and i don't know maybe once i finish my big my big thesis paper that i'm gonna write which will admittedly be, I'm, I haven't written a paper in like 11, 12 years. So we, we'll see how this works out. Um, but um, I figure it'll be a good experience no matter what. Because um, role playing to me is very relaxing. It's very fun. And um, I'm glad I get a chance to share something with you guys. I think we all have become better friends through this. I've learned things about everybody here. Um, and uh we want to grow with you, the audience. So hopefully you're enjoying this during our off weeks. We definitely enjoy putting it together, though. Getting everybody together sometimes is like herding cats. But um, 
that's the nature of any D and D group getting everybody together on the same day for the same time for the same amount of hours. So, um, any thoughts from cat? As I remember to unmute myself, um, I actually have loads of game suggestions, but ones that would be like much shorter. Um, okay. Not quite the, um, the, you know, not like campaigns, but like one shots. Um, because I, I recently got my first chance to actually DM. So I've never done that up until now. And it was very nerve wracking. So I know where you're coming from with how, uh, it's so stressful. It's stressful, but fun. Um, and I DM'd a game called Sexy Battle Wizards, which is a one shot <laughs> written by Grant Howitt. Um, with his, uh, he's got a, a games company called and Rook and Decker. And they put out like mm, a shit ton of one shots. They have a ton of them that are like really simple, um, th that are just really fun things. So they have, um, if you do watch Critical Role, you will have probably seen that group play Honey Heist before, which is one of Grant Howitt's. Um, he does another one called Jason Statham's Big Vacation. Um, Goblin Quest, Goat Crasher, um, Crash Pandas, lots of really cool, very fun, not D and D things. Uh, some are a little bit more D and D, but a lot of them are just extremely simple mechanics that are extremely play heavy. And I found that I really enjoy that sort of game because, like the bigger games and stuff, um, like a Star Wars or a Doctor Who, if I have to learn new mechanics. It is a slog for me. It's why I've like latched on to D and D is because there's so many people out there playing D and D now that I can just go watch somebody play it and then um, learn the rules via osmosis and into a game. And I already know how this. With a lot of other games, it's gonna like I have to wire my brain to learn new mechanics, and that's why I really like the one shot. Rules are so simple; even I can deal with it, which is a whole thing. Um, and this is something where I probably wouldn't mind DMing it because they're, they're simple. Like we could, you know, get like maybe a couple of episodes out of it. You really don't need like weeks and weeks of planning and recording and playing. And it, it would just be like, you get drunk one night and you play this ridiculous game where, where you play as skeleton and it's just simple little fun stuff. Um, so I wouldn't mind bringing those to the table. If anybody has heard of any of Grant Howitt's games that you think we might like, because a lot of his games are actually free. Um, so if we play it and then you think it's interesting, you can also play it free. So if you've heard of any of those games that you might be interested in, let us know. And, you know, we'll look at it. We'll look at it. See, I'm just hearing all this as a new player and going, oh, shit, these, these are a hundred new systems that I'm going to have to learn. And I'm yeah. still trying to come this one again that's why i liked uh, like when we played sexy battle wizard all you had d6s and that was yeah, it the, the doctor who system is, is 2d6 it's dead easy yeah um you're not having a, 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 as much experience with tabletop role playing as as the girls here uh i don't really have anything to add i mean i've already i've already put in my vote for a, a prequel story for no other reason than it keeps me in this system and I can actually get some more practice with it because there's still shit on this character sheet that I have no idea what it is like just as an example there's this fucking green plus symbol next to my dexterity that I have no idea what the fuck that means um but uh that said uh when uh, my buddy Hambone who I mentioned on Nerd Power he's the guy who uh made the Ninja Star uh d20 uh, when he found out that I was getting into Dungeons and Dragons, he's one of those people who he, when he finds out that you're into something that he's into, he goes all ADHD and just drowns you in stuff. And he got me for Christmas an Eberron uh, source book that I've been kind of flipping through. And uh, and that's a cool world. Yeah. So uh, yeah, for Christmas he got me an Eberron source book, which I've been kind of flipping through, and and it looks like an interesting universe. I'm I'm particularly enamored with the uh, the Warforged, who are basically magic robots. Yep. So I'm like, you know, this might be something, you know, worth exploring down the line. But uh, as 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 far as season two goes, I mean, it, as far as far as my edit, my schedule goes, I because I work weekend nights, uh, my schedule during the week is pretty open. So it wouldn't be too hard to have multiple uh, campaigns running and releasing at the same time. 
Um, so there's nothing saying that we can't like double dip, you know. I would have, just have... like to point out that usually I'm recording quite late at night with you guys. So Yeah. So that'll 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 be something to discuss off air. Yes. But you know, it's just something to to throw out there. Um, you know, it's 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 real easy for me to just sit down and you know, it takes just a couple hours to pound out an episode. Um, but you know, going back to something that Mike said earlier about uh, me putting a lot of effort into this, which I do. Uh, what do you what did you guys think of uh, how the first season has been put together so far? You're coming along as an as an editor, and I, I for someone who didn't go to school for it, you should be proud. Well, like, I mean, you know, what do you think of the, the, the music, the effects? You know, how, how, like, you know, what, give, 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 give me some feedback on the composition here. That's all. That's all I can really say. For, from a technical standpoint, you have done well. You like you're. I'm tr trying to give you the more ac academic, if if I will. Basically, if you were, you're, you're politely student, trying to tell me you haven't listened to it yet, have you? <laughs> I've listened to bits and pieces. What a, <laughs> what I'm telling you is, if you were a student in my class, you'd get a solid B plus. You've really come a long way. Like your right. editing skills are hitting the right marks. All right. Well, uh, Kat, Skybus, what about you two? You guys, have you guys listened to uh, any of the finished product yet? Uh, no, because listening to my own voice is weird. Yeah, I know. Last week we said we were going to listen to it. That's why. Uh, I, the last that's week why I just scrubbed through stuff. All right. Well, then, I, then I'm going to warn you. I'm going to bring this up in, in in our next to the third power recording. <laughs> so you got homework to do till Tuesday. But last week I has think, been a nightmare. On, I, I think, promise. I think I Tony was Tony was going to listen to it. Let me see if he has. <laughs> It's, um, yeah. Yeah, I never, it's it's just, like, Skyblaze and I are too, never go back and listen to our because it's just, you know. I've, I don't I've either, but, I, but, I, but I've got to fucking edit the thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why, like, if you were editing it, and it was all, like, on somebody else, we'd probably be like, well, do we really need to keep podcasting? <laughs> because none of us want to edit or listen to ourselves. Uh I I just I just show up and I talk into a microphone, my friend. Can you I just perform. That's all I do. <laughs> all right, so so Tony, you get to be Skyblaze's meat shield, uh, because <laughs> because she <laughs> she refused she she refuses to 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 listen to her own product. So she says you've listened yeah. to uh, the podcast so far. So so what do you, what do you think so far of how it's been put together? Uh, I've been enjoying. I quite enjoyed the, uh, the the additional bits and pieces in terms of the background noise and things put in. Uh, especially because I remember that I remember the first episode where after you've all had the horrible nightmare and you mention it, that uh, uh, Guy Blaze ends up dropping the cup, and obviously you have that noise come into it as like ah, oh, nice touch like that. Yeah, uh, I I I I went searching for uh, and 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 that that's fine. We don't need you anymore, Tony. You can be free to leave. <laughs> you are just thank you, thank you. It's so kind. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I. I really wanted to not just have the show just be us talking in a bunch of dead air. So I went and found uh, a website called Zap Splat that actually has thousands of free use and public domain uh, sound effects and even some music. Uh, so that's where I've been pulling most of the sound effects and background noise from. Uh, and where I haven't, I've, I've tried to pull music that is public domain. Uh, side note, did you know Johann Sebastian Bach wrote a shitload of lute music that is absolutely perfect for bards to sing? Because I didn't. Well, and uh, yeah, You've learned so, a thing. Yeah. So that's where I've been pulling that from. And I, I, I've tried very hard not to have the, the, the sound effects be overpowering, but at the same time, I want to just have like that little bit of flavor uh, in the background. Kind of, you know, add a little bit of immersion to it. That that's why I say composing an audio drama and a podcast because this is something some some other projects that I've done have experimented with. It can be very hard to mix and measure, and if you have the proper ear for it and you're getting your proper things leveled, it works out well. Like I said, you've you've definitely come a long way, and I like from what I've heard, which is I do admit is not much. You've done well. Well, I would just again just remind you, I'm gonna be asking again on Tuesday. So, <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna be going out drinking tonight. I'm probably gonna spend most of tomorrow hungover. Then I've got my Radio Sega show. <laughs> what do you want from me? This is my Monday. I don't get a day off until the middle of next week. This is. 
Oh yeah, um, and I've got I've got like three video games I've got to review for work. You know all I hear are excuses. <laughs> Shut They've up, cat! You're not helping. I'm trying to make an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, we want to continue doing this project. I mean, as time allows, it'll be a little more difficult during the summer because it gets friggin' hot where we are. But we'll figure it out. Um, please, please complain to me about the heat. <laughs> Hey man, when you weigh as much as a small car, no, um, heat sucks. Um, actually, no, it's not do the you, heat; it, you, it's the humidity. The humidity. Yeah, we're what? getting sidetracked. Yeah, do you anyway. have a, do you have aircon where you are? Barely. Try the UK. No aircon for us. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, you would have aircon by now. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, we have tons of ideas. We have tons of potential game masters. We want to keep doing this for you guys. So please send us feedback. Um, preferably not, you know, don't be a douchebag. Um, be encouraging. Um, so I guess there isn't a whole hell of a lot else uh, to say here. I mean, the only other thing I'd potentially pitch at you guys as a game is Cyberpunk's going to be coming out this year that world is really interesting and the world and the rules are pretty easy to learn i i got the cyberpunk red um starter set from our talsorian and it, it's not bad the world's pretty cool and you could have little john or little keanu reeves if you want to have johnny silverhand in your game so um which would always be fun because you're breathtaking um anyway um uh, so i guess let's uh wrap this up so we will see you again for Fools Who Ride Season 2. Uh, so we have been... Dr. Gonzo. The Cat. And Skyblaze. I have been your Game Master Storyteller for this season. So until next time, the table is closed, the Cheetos are stuck to the floor, and... Um, it better not well, be. I'm renting this house, and I can't afford to clean this carpet. Good times. We'll catch you again next time, right here on Nerd to the Third and on ThisWeekInGeek.net. <laughs>